Okay, this is part two of the video on Jutland. And in part one, we saw in the search procedure how the British fleet was coming in from the west and the German fleet was coming in from the east. So now we're going to go to the battle procedure to show you how that works. Now prior to the battle, the British would have made up their task forces. And in this case, the Germans have encountered task force number one which for the British consists of 19 ships arranged in three columns 14,000 yards apart. Now all that information would have had to been decided before the battle actually in the search procedure. Now the German fleet is actually going to be all in one. They put all the ships together. They're going to be coming in in two columns and they're also 14,000 yards apart. So now we'll set up that scenario and see what it looks like. Okay, now there we have the General Jutland set up for the battle as it occurred on the uh, search board. Now north is at the top of the screen and you can see to the left the British are in three columns about 14,000 yards apart. The three ships you see at the top, that's the battle cruiser squadron. Then we have a middle squadron and a squadron near the bottom. Now the Germans chose to come in on two columns and you can see we're hard pressed for space. At the top of the German column you can see the five battle cruisers and to the bottom there you see the main German line. And even at the end there I've had to stack a few of the ships. Those are actually the old pre-dreadnoughts. So you can see that Jutland takes quite a bit of room. And I think that's why it was not a really popular game. Um, you just you need a lot of space to play it. So, we'll go through some turns here and show you how the combat procedure works. Uh, I do emphasize that it does take a lot of space, as you can see. But anyway, we'll move the German and uh, British vessels and see what we get. Now, I should point out that one of the big problems of all naval combat is bringing your ships to bear. Now, it's all fine for the British to be outnumbered, uh, outnumbering the Germans in a particular situation or in this case perhaps the Germans outnumber the British. But bringing your ships to bear is the big secret, the big um, tactic you have to watch out for in these games. Is you have to bring your uh, guns to bear to make any difference in the battle. And that's going to be very difficult with three columns. But let's see how, they, um, how the game goes after the Germans move their vessels. Okay, that's the situation after the Germans have done their turn. You can see the battle cruiser um, wing has done a 90 degree turn and moved directly north, as has the main column. And as you can see, it's going to take a while for the rear of the German line to come up. So now we'll do the British move, see what they do. Okay, just to give you an idea of the range, maximum firing range in this scale, it's at 20,000 yards. And that's, that's why I put the uh, range finder down there. At the end, the far left end, is the maximum sighting range. So technically, the fleets haven't uh, even sighted each other. So I'm going to have the British go straight ahead. Okay, that's the situation after the British have moved. And they're still technically not within firing range. Now, you can see that column near the bottom there the British one. The two lead ships are actually faster than the back of the column, so I've had them move nine uh, notches and the other uh, ships have moved eight. So it's possible that those two ships might start to outdistance the rear of the column. So we'll go into another maneuver and fire turn and uh, see what happens, because the ships are not within firing range yet. Okay, there you see the German fleet after it's moved. I've had the battle cruisers slow down, continue to go straight ahead. The main fleet is still doing its turn, and you can see the rear pre-dreadnought ships are still having a time catching up there. It's going to be a long time before they come to bear. And of course the British over here on the left, who haven't moved the British yet. Let's see what they can do. Now, I'm not saying that these are optimum tactics or anything like that. What we're trying to do is show you some movement to uh, get some firing in to show you how the game works. So let's move the British now. 
Okay, the British decide to um, come on in like a bull in a china shop and head straight into the British or the German guns, which they probably normally wouldn't do. Now they're just within firing range now, so we'll probably see some firing uh, this turn. Okay, checking the firing range there, I can see that a couple of ships are in range. So the head of that British center column can be fired by the ship um, just opposite, crossing the T actually. Now it is at maximum range, but let's do our first firing. Okay, in the advanced game you don't use the uh, gunnery factors that are on the counters, you use what's on the German hit record. And in this case we have the Prince Regent Leutpold firing at the Royal Oak, I think it is. So you count the number of boxes, in this case they can, she can use her entire broadside. So it's 3, 5, 7, she can fire on the 12 table. That's what she will be doing, firing on the 12 table. Prince Regent Leutpold. Okay, and that's the gunnery table. So the Prince Regent Leutpold firing on the Royal Oak. Let's see what she gets. We'll roll the die. And she rolls a 2 which means she inflicts two hits on the Royal Oak. Now at that range, it also mentions on the um, chart that hits are halved. So we look for the Royal Oak here. She's on the hit record and we cross off one gunnery box to show that she's taken a hit there. So that's generally how firing works. It's rather simple, but it's um, kind of effective. Now the Royal Oak should be able to fire back with her bow guns. Let's see what kind of shot she can get. While looking at the bow guns, Royal Oak has six. One, two, three, four, five, six. These guns all fire forward. Now firing is simultaneous, so we don't count this hit yet. So the Prince, uh, rather the Royal Oak, will be firing back at the Prince Regent Leutpold on the six table. Okay, the Royal Oak's firing, and she rolls a one, which means actually two hits. But we have that because of the distance. So, so she inflicts one hit on the on the Prince Regent Leutpold, and we would mark that off here on the front because that would tend to hit the front guns. And that's a typical firing. Each has inflicted, in this case, one hit on each other. Okay, now two other German vessels happen to be within range of the Royal Oak. The ship ahead of the um, Prince Regent Leopold and uh, the ship behind, which in this case happens to be the Markgraf and the Crown Prince Wilhelm. So they'll each get a shot at the Royal Oak and uh, we'll take up the video after they fired. Okay, the result of that firing was that the two ships inflicted, in the end, one more hit on the Royal Oak because those hits were halved. So we're on to the, what, the fourth maneuver and fire turn. Now, I should point out that six turns here on the battle board represent one turn on the search board. So after six turns, if these ships are not in sight of each other, not very likely, but it could happen that the battle would be over. But meanwhile, other forces on the search board would move one hexagon after six turns here on the battle board. So other forces theoretically could enter the battle if they were one hour's steaming away. So let's do the next turn and see what happens. Okay, well the German player is quite content to continue crossing the British T, so they move ahead at about six notches. And you can see the rear of the column still has a bit of a way to come up. I haven't moved the British yet. They're going to have to react soon or continue to get their T crossed. Let's see what uh, they can do. Okay, well the British decide that they can't continue to have their T crossed. So you can see up in the north there, the three battle cruisers have turned to the left and are now parallel with the German line. And the center column is now doing a bit of an oblique turn. They're going to get a little bit punished from all those German ships on the right. They feel they've got to turn and begin to fire at least uh, at the Germans. And the column on the right decides to split to the south, southeast actually, and try to engage the Germans. So we'll do this maneuver 
and fire turn and uh, I'll probably end the video and do a little bit of a summation just wanted to give you an idea how how it works but there'll be a lot of firing this turn so I won't do a shot by shot scene of what's going on we'll do a zoom in shot first okay I hope that's in focus you can see the uh, crux the turn in the German line there and we're just pulling ahead that's the German head head of the German line over to the left is the three British battle cruisers and moving down we've got the center column British doing its turn and over here the other British column splintering off to the right okay so obviously what's going to happen is the three lead German ships will engage the British uh, battle cruisers and maybe the next two vessels behind them and the rest of the line one two three four five at least seven vessels will be able to engage those three vessels from the center there and these British vessels there will probably be able to engage these corner vessels of the Germans so I'll stop the video there and uh, let's pick up the, uh, the results after we've done all the firing see what's happened okay that was a really odd uh, maneuver and fire turn now overall the Germans managed to inflict about 22 hits on various British vessels like the St. Vincent the three British battle cruisers got pummeled indomitable and flexible invincible just virtually got their guns knocked out also the Hercules took two hits so overall they did 22 hits on the um, British and they achieved one critical hit which would leave the Royal Oak dead in the water which would be very bad news now the British got some some interesting hits on the Germans they only got about eight hits three five six seven eight eight hits but they got one two three critical hits and they were really ugly critical hits two of them left the ship dead in the water and the other one is what minus four in speed so the critical hits were very bad and um, I know the critical hits is an optional rule and I think they are a little probably too much uh, having three ships dead in the water in the first 20 minutes is a little bit much so if I was to play this again I'm not so sure I would play with that critical hit table so that's the result of the firing on this what fifth battle turn I lost track here so that overall is the uh, game Jutland just wanted you to um, expose you, uh, expose the game to you and see what you thought um, I still like it as a great game now as you can see this has taken a while to even do this these few turns on the battle board so this is a game that will take quite a long time to finish I think not long compared to some of the monster games I've seen but it certainly can't be played I'm not sure in under two hours or, or so it depends how long the search procedure takes but it's a fine game now I'll just close with one last thing about the search procedure the search procedure that I showed was a simplified search procedure because um, if you're using all the optional rules the search procedure can be um, you can use U-boats and zeppelins there's weather the search procedure is a lot more complicated than I showed it but uh, I wanted to keep it simple for the video so um, that's our look at the 1967 game of Jutland by Avalon Hill. Still an old favorite of mine.